one in five parents drink too much by the way drink enough that's hazardous to the people around them yeah mm. so there's a lot of kids that are going home to all these difficult stuff they might be going home to a mum and dad that don't want to be together anymore mm. they might be going home to a mum and dad that have just split up they might be going home to one parent because one parent was never there mm. and yet if they feel sadness they are taught consciously and more prominently subconsciously that they shouldn't feel sad mm. that when they feel sad it's they're supposed to make themselves feel better mm. whereas actually if we took every individual mm. in the context of their full environment and the full life experiences that they're having then it makes total sense that they're sad it's it's like you know their body should be feeling it they should be feeling sad and what they lack is not the ability to be happy they lack people around them to support them and come around them and help them feel sad Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Josh Connolly. Josh is a resilience and breathwork facilitator. He is one of the UK's most influential mental health advocates who regularly speaks on BBC, ITV and Channel 5 News. He has spoken in the House of Commons contributed to mental health policy and even advised the script writing team on Hollyoaks. Josh runs resilience workshops for village schools and global brands alike. He is an ambassador of Nicoa, a national charity supporting people affected by parents drinking. Let's bring him on. Hey Josh, how's it going, man? Good. I'm good actually. Uh <laughs> I'm look I'm looking for I'm looking forward to this to this conversation honestly I know me too I mean too man it's like um I like I knew as soon as I was going to start my series 3 I was like I need to get Josh on top being on a uh Krish who's a ambassador not ambassador he was a CEO of Tilson Spire was like Krish get Josh on get Josh on <laughs> get on, get him on my podcast you can see him at breathwork session just chill out I was like but I want <laughs> so one in a fist bump he was like you coming on my podcast I'm not saying no for an answer <laughs> Uh, it's all good man it's all good so um to start off with you know uh tell us a bit about you who you are who is josh who's josh oh well i guess like you know as well as being a father of six children um <laughs> and a husband uh I, i i work a lot in the healing space today so i do a lot of resilience work in in the corporate environment so i work with a lot of businesses to help them sort of develop a the self awareness that i believe that you need to in order to develop resilience mm-hmm. um and then i help a lot of people particularly people who have had difficult perhaps difficult dysfunctional upbringings or anybody really that struggles emotionally or struggles with the ways that they feel um and i do that in a lot of different ways from online programs online content to uh breathwork sessions as well um mm-hmm. and and it seems to be that the breathwork sessions at the moment are the thing that are really kind of taken off and people are uh, uh, are excited to try um so yeah that's that's your man very fortunate i get to do a lot of different fun and exciting things in my life today which is good yeah that's amazing i mean your breathwork is like incredible i've been to it um a couple of weeks ago and that was the first time i've been to a breathwork like that you know i've uh, i've done breathwork you know in yoga and here and there um and because like you know i used to suffer from extreme anxiety to a point i could not leave that so it's a shallow breathing has always been that thing you know when you're always anxious in in a, a freeze response Um so I was a bit reluctant to go to your breathwork cuz it was like how oh, am I going to breathe for this long I don't know how to <laughs> breathe um but it was just incredible experience um honestly like from start to finish it was just like the like I I didn't really think that was going to be able to breathe through the mouth for that long but and I did and, and a lot of emotional stuff came up and it's like you know your body keeps the score your body t- it takes in a lot of trauma um and it's like it was just coming out and it wasn't even anything specific it was just emotions that was coming out like i guess it was storing and and the scream at the end was like yeah let rip it was amazing it's really really good so how long have you been like kind of doing that um breathwork um sessions 
Uh, delivering them myself, I got, I got, I qualified maybe, I want to say three years ago. Mm. Um, I've been doing a bit like bits of it myself without like, like actually delivering it. Um, and then qualified like three years ago. Um, but I think that's the big thing about it is what you said, right? Is that we can talk about everything and we should as much as we can, but that for me only does so much, you know, we store so much in our body that you know, is there from, because we were triggered by something that happened to us before we had our rational brain, right? Before we were talking, right? Um, and so I know my body's responding to the environment all of the time. Mm. Yeah. And so talking in some respects doesn't help in those moments. No. Yeah, because um, because it's trapped in my body and it's a body thing. So mm. so the breath work's amazing, I think, for for doing that. And that's why I think, people are really taken to it you know mm. because look i tell people what's going to happen they 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 sort of don't believe me um they or, or they don't feel like they're going to be able to do it mm. um and then they do it and i've never had anybody do the breath work and say no it didn't really work i've had people you know some people don't enjoy it or uh it doesn't really work for them but i've never had anybody say no nothing happened yeah it's just impossible to do it and yeah that and i guess like it, it goes back to as all um like we I've been in and out of counseling for years and years and years, like, you know, in the system kind of counseling, like just talking therapy, talking therapy. And it's like, we barely scratched the surface of the trauma that I experienced when I was younger and all my life. Right. So, mm. um, and it's a, such a great point that you just made. Cause like our body keeps the score, like I said, like, and a lot, a lot of emotions come out and I didn't, you know, you, most people don't realize by simple breath work, you can get that out of your system it's it's just incredible i love it i love it um so let's talk about a resilience coach you're a resilience coach so what do you do what is it what what's involved in it so like mainly in the, in the corporates a lot of uh a lot of companies get me in because they they feel like the resilience is depleted um within their teams um and the way that i always work with anything that i do is i really try and keep like a very human centered experience right it's very um experience led rather than like giving people necessarily mm. like these over rationalized ideas of how they should deal with things mm. i know that we're all different i know we all suffer in similar ways actually sometimes but what we need is different you know the what might work for me when i'm feeling emotionally overwhelmed might not work for you right so, so the work that I do is to help people to develop an understanding of who they are, what their needs are, what things stress them and overwhelm them, um, and how they find some of the tools they might need to be able to move through that. Mm, yeah. Mm. Um, to understand that resilience isn't just about keep pushing forward all of the time. Mm. It's way more about self-understanding and the resources to be able to deal with the things that happen to you, you know? Mm, amazing. And I think we know we... Is we come in at an age where a lot of people, especially during pandemic as well, a lot of people need that, you know, because in our generation, we've not experienced anything like this in this generation where the whole world went on hold. You know, our grandparents or our parents might have grandparents have seen uh, war, the world war. And that's like, you know, that's the big global thing. Um, and I think like diving into more coaches now, um, a lot of kids these days are suffering from mental health, um, uh, you know, since pandemic and we're finding it hard to link it back to the lockdowns. Um, so, yeah, I think it's amazing. The, the work that you do, I think it's amazing. Um, Thank you. So the journey, let's talk about your journey. How did it start? Where did it start? I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I get like, look, my I guess my journey to where I am today started when I was like 24 years old in 2012 when I stopped drinking alcohol. Mm. And I think when I stopped drinking alcohol, I thought that my problem was alcohol. Right. And I thought I'm going to stop drinking and my life will will get better. But what happened is, is that um, it set me on a path and on a journey for the last 11 years of really mm. exploring who I am, exploring my experiences and and going from somebody who thought I had a pretty normal upbringing to starting to realize that in the initial years, at least like within my, in my sort of first nine years of my life, when my dad was still alive, uh, I grew up in, a, in, in what was a lot of dysfunction and 
Um, my dad had a problem with alcohol, so I saw a lot of difficult stuff and would have been in a lot of difficult environments, particularly when I was very, very young. Mm. And they would have had a, 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 a big and major impact on me. And, and I realized that today, you know, I realized that so much of what I struggle with and what I find difficult in my life are because I react to the world from that place of, of struggle, mm. you know, mm. that I had when I was a child. Um, and so, you know, when I stopped drinking and all of them emotions came back, I had a, a long a, a period of time where life was really, really difficult. I, 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 I know that I used alcohol to escape the ways that I feel. And so, mm now I no longer had a way to escape, escape the ways that I feel. I went back to just being somebody who couldn't deal with the ways that I feel. Mm. Right. Mm. And it was a problem. It was a real problem. And, um, I was about nine months sober when I decided that I, I couldn't do it anymore, that life was too difficult. And I made a decision that felt like a very honest and noble one to not be here anymore. And I went to see my kids and because I knew that what I was going to do, the past became irrelevant and the future was non-existent. And for the first time ever in my life, I was like really present with my kids in a way that I'd never experienced before. And it was, mm -hmm. it was kind of in that weekend that I changed my mind ultimately. And I think since then is when I've really been on this journey of understanding myself on a much deeper level, you know, mm -hmm. really wanting to be gut level honest with myself um, to try and find out how much power I had in my life to be able to navigate life in a, uh, in a way that didn't feel so difficult. Mm. And I'm getting there slowly. I feel yeah. like I'm getting there. I'm, you know, I'm building more tools each and every day. So you would, um, you would say that that was your ultimate inner spiritual awakening in a way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That weekend was, was was the big spiritual awakening for me. Mm. And I think in a lot of ways, I went from, I went from realizing that I can't control everything. Yeah. And the reason that it's so spiritual is because what underpinned that was the realization that, and this, this is my experience and my realization. And again, everybody's different, but I guess my big realization was that, um, there must be, there's something out there that drives the way that the world works and mm. it's bigger than me, right? Mm. Whether that's the universe or the world, science, God, you know, and I've had different opinions on that, to be honest with you, over the years, that's changed and evolved. But I, one thing I know to be true is that whatever it is, there's a big part of life that's out of my control, yeah? Mm. Um, and so the spiritual awakening is to go, what can I do to work on myself um, to be able to navigate that in a way that feels less heavy and less difficult and less hard all of the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I agree. Like, I think this is quite interesting because um, a lot of people that I interview and then a lot of people who I meet in the spiritual communities, um, they've all had some sort of addictions from in the past and that all all goes down to sensitivity to trauma um mm -hmm. and obviously when they had their spiritual awakening most of them i would say about 99 percent of them have stopped drinking right um so would you think sensitivity plays a huge part um in addictions as well as trauma I think um, the biggest, most undertalked piece of the whole puzzle, yeah? Not like, and I think addiction, by the way, underpins ev like a lot of this stuff, yeah? We often just think of addiction as being like alcohol or drugs or things like that. I think everybody's got addiction, yeah? yeah. I, think, I think as a society, we're riddled with addiction. Like scrolling from, through our social media. From <laughs> phones to yeah. sugar, which, you know, which companies make sure they lace in every bit of food that you eat now so that you're addicted and you buy more. Like, I think addiction is everywhere. But I do think that the most undertalked, undervalued, really, piece of the puzzle is the level of sensitivity. Mm. And I think, you know, I'm a highly sensitive person. Mm. I'm a I'm a I'm a highly sensitive person. Um that in itself is not a negative thing, mm. but it's it's so grossly misunderstood in Western culture anyway. 
Yeah, important for me to say that because it's I think there's a massive arrogance in Western culture for the belief that the world buys into everything that we believe, including mm. how we how we uh, uh, pathologize people's distress, which is another conversation in itself. But um, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> well, I will, I will, I will, I <laughs> will. Uh, but 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 the sensitivity is not so. It was never nurtured in me. I don't think we nurture it in young people. And actually, in Western culture, we think that sensitivity is a problem. Mm -hmm. We need to try and metaphorically, or sometimes probably even physically, beat out of our kids. Yes. So you know, we we teach kids to toughen up, mm -hmm. and so it's natural that as a sensitive person who gets oversensed very easily, that when I was twelve years old and I smoked cannabis for the first time. Mm. Well, I found something that worked, mm, yeah? Mm. And then alcohol quickly followed and other things like that. And I, I think this is a big problem. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, rather than helping and supporting young children to find a way to be able to deal with their sensitivity, we wait till they start using drink and drugs and then all scratch our head going, why are they addicted? Yeah. And I think, well, because they no one else gave them anything else, you know? Yeah. So, like, I think that's a big thing, yeah. Yeah, and, and, that, and that and vulnerability, you're not allowed to be vulnerable. So tapping yeah. into feeling. So what we do at Tales to Inspire, like, you know, me and my colleague, Laura, you met her once. Yeah, we no, went Laura, to, yeah. yeah, we go into, uh, we have a six week program where we deliver these workshops to kids and, you know, emotionally regulate. It's okay to have all those feelings. The, the question that we ask is like, um, do you think all emotions are good emotions? Do you think bad emotions are, are, are okay? And most of them say it's not because mm -hmm. that's what they've been taught. And that's yeah. what the world says that it's not okay to be sad. It's not okay to feel angry. It's not okay. So they label that label that as bad and then they're walking around with these emotions and and feeling shame in yeah. feeling them yeah, yeah right yeah and look so this is the thing isn't it in western culture we take an emotion like sadness and we say sadness is bad or it's a negative emotion so we're not supposed to feel it mm. so so nobody you get a classroom full of 30 children right some of them are going home to a mum or a dad who drinks and passes out every single night. Mm. Some of them are going home to domestic violence, right? And this is in every class of 30. Mm. Yes, one or two is going home to, one in five parents drink too much, by the way, drink enough that's hazardous to the people around them, yeah? Mm. So there's a lot of kids that are going home to all these difficult stuff. They might be going home to a mum and dad that don't want to be together anymore. Mm. They might be going home to a mum and dad that have just split up. They mm. might be going home to one parent because one parent was never there. Mm. And yet, if they feel sadness, they are taught consciously and more prominently subconsciously that they shouldn't feel sad. Mm. That when they feel sad, it's they're supposed to make themselves feel better. Mm. Whereas actually, if we took every individual mm. in the context of their full environment and the full life experiences that they're having, then it makes total sense that they're sad. It's, it's like, you know, their body should be feeling it. They should be feeling sad. And what they lack is not the ability to be happy. They lack people around them to support them and come around them and help them feel sad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and that, yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. Um, and then I think going back to your journey as well, like, you know, when you were younger, um, would you would you be open to talking about um, what yeah. was going on around, around your environment and how you felt? Yeah. Some of what I talk about in terms of what was going on when I was a child, yeah, is not necessarily perfectly uh, like actual recall memory. Yeah, because I don't remember all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that is because I blanked it out and some of that is because it was so overstimulating when it happened that I disassociated in the moment. And so I didn't recall it, but that doesn't mean I don't remember it. It's all stored in my body, right? And I can hypothesize about stuff. You know, mm -hmm. my my dad was quite violent and angry when he drank. Mm. and when I'm three or four years old and he's come home and he's drunk and he's smashing the house up and I see my mum desperately sad and upset and crying and scared and I'm scared like I mean to think that that I've then got to go to school the next day and act like everything's fine because of the shame and stigma that comes with addiction mm. you know I'm going to school hearing the kids that are having fun feeling that other kids are seem to be in a quite a good place. And I'm not like that. Mm. And I'm never talking about it. I'm never sharing in that experience. I'm never being held in any of my difficult emotions ever as a child. My mum was in too much distress as a result of what she was experiencing. Mm. 
Mm. Um, and so she didn't have the emotional bandwidth or capacity, right? Of course she didn't. That's not her fault, but she didn't. Mm. Um, so I was left with all these difficult emotions all of the time. And then you go to school and you have to present in a certain way at school, mm. which is, you know, and I'm not, I'm not having to go at schools because I work with loads of schools. And I think a lot of teachers want things to be different, but you know, they're, it's higher up that their hands are tied, but you know, little children that are living at home with domestic violence are still made to go to school the next day and sit down and shut up for eight hours <laughs> and do work. Right. Yeah. Like, like, you wouldn't do that to an adult. You would like you wouldn't have an adult watch their parent get beat up the night before, mm. and then tell them that they've got to go to work, perform, and be quiet for most of the day. You wouldn't do it, and yet it's happening with kids all of the time, everywhere. And and the same happened for me, which was I couldn't just sit still. Mm. I couldn't be quiet, and so I acted out the ways that I felt. And then had that behavior pathologized and had that shamed and said that was wrong and removed from classes. And I was a problem mm. when, mm. when, when, and this is, let me just say this. And this is a good way of looking at it. The emotional wounding that I experienced as a child. Yeah. If I'd have turned up to school on a Monday with that emotional wounding as physical wounding mm. visible on me, yeah. So bleeding everywhere, bumps and lumps and open wounds and in a terrible state, which is what I had the equivalent of on the inside. If I walked into the class screaming, nobody would say, right, you can sit outside the class. You're a problem. You're getting in the way of all the other students. Yeah. Mm. Right. I've got to teach you that. You're going in isolation for the rest of the day. Nobody yeah. would say that. Mm. Nobody would say, well, uh, you know, it is a shame that you're like that, but I've got all these other teach these other students to teach, uh, and we haven't got the capacity to be able to deal with somebody who's acting like you. Go and sit in isolation. Mm. No, oh, somebody would say, get this child some help. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, uh, but that's what we're dealing with because it's all internal. That's not what happens. Mm. Mm. And yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think the schooling system is like we we need a wave of new energy going into the schooling system and just kind of just change certain aspects and you know um and I think like it's such a great place to be because there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of uh work like like ourselves going into schools and wanting to break go into schools and change the perspective and the system that's like all paradigm that you mm -hmm. know it needs to be shifting because there's new energies that's coming in that's supposed to be like we need to integrate yeah. um and yeah so you know i think we are on a journey there and i and you know it's you know i can get like it's so um challenging and difficult um when you go when you're in such a survival survival mode at home and you go into an envir environment where they just shame you and blame you um for misbehaving that you have yeah. to be a certain way. You have to walk a straight line. You have to do this and you have to be timed on their time. You know, when it's yeah. as humans, we're not supposed to be like that at all. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, your dad um, passed away. Would you like to share a bit about around what was going on? Yeah. So he, he had spent some time in prison and then when he came out of prison, he couldn't uh control his drinking there, there was drugs as well i think when he came out of prison mm -hmm. um and essentially i was at his his flat when when it happened and uh i i didn't phone an ambulance because i didn't think my mum would be able to deal with the fact that i'd seen it so i just waited at the flat and eventually my mum rang the phone and i said dad's really drunk you need to pick us up and my mum picked me up out the front and i went home and and then later found out that he had passed away so like it was a really, um, if I if I think of myself at nine years old, you know, and I've had to do a lot of work around actually recognizing that the boy that that happened to was me, you know, mm -hmm. because I'd separated myself from it as a way of protecting myself. But after he died, we, like he was never talked about again mm -hmm. uh, in my house, you know, it was all swept under the carpet. It was still now my family don't talk about it. I don't know what date he died on. I don't really know when his birthday was. Um, it's just not talked about in my house, you know, and mm. again, this is another Western culture thing. Um, 
we tell kids to be brave when they're struggling. And what we mean is, I don't want you to present the emotion because I know that it will be too difficult for me to deal with. So let me tell you to be brave. You'll hold it in and I get to feel more comfortable. Mm. Like we tell people to be brave from from a place of fear. Mm. And, um, and so I be brave all my life, you know, and I was celebrated for that. Mm. I put brave in quote marks, yeah, because... Mm. True brave, true bravery is releasing and processing and allowing my emotions to come out, right? Mm. Um, but I did the Western idea of that, which is push my emotions down into my body so I don't experience them. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's the same in the, in our culture as well. It's not just a Western. I think um, I'm originally from Pakistan and it's mm. exactly the same where um, parents was like won't show you any emotion. You're not allowed to show any emotion, suppress the emotion. Um, mm. you're not allowed to say this is how you feel um, or felt when they said this um, everything is uh, under the carpet and if you're not doing things a certain way then it will bring shame on the family yeah again shame is a massive word in this world it's just like so many of us walking around carrying <laughs> carrying it um, yeah 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 and we see by the way it like we see it in a lot of cultures yeah in, in with nakoa which is the charity that i'm an ambassador for that supports children affected by parents drinking um i forget the name of the uh the thing that we're doing but we're, we're doing something it's called widening access so mm. we did like a big study into um the different challenges that people from different uh cultures face when it comes to a parent that drinks too much. And there's a mm. guy, Jazz Rye, um, credible chap. Um, and he runs something called the Seek Recovery Network. And I was at Parliament last year and there were lots of people from these these cultures that were talking about like how deep rooted the shame is there, right? Mm. And how like it is, you do not speak out. I mean, it's almost like it's it's almost like fairly uh implicit in western culture is in like you know we try and say you should speak out right but but the shame is a bit too much so we don't mm -hmm. but in some of these other cultures it's like very explicit you like you are a bad person i don't care how bad it is at home mm -hmm. yeah you carry on supporting the abuse or whatever it is you know mm -hmm. so although i haven't experienced it being around some of that stuff you realize you know and it's it's almost like a under talked about piece of the conversation right is the different cultures mm. and, and and the impacts that the different cultures have which is why when i'm talking i always talk about western culture because i want people to understand i'm talking from a western culture experience when there are many different experiences oh, yeah. some of which are, are way worse and some of which are i've actually probably closer to getting it right you know mm. yeah i completely get and i think this conversation having good this conversation with you is quite healing as well not that it's like it happens everywhere but also i currently um i was this is just me coming out i was in an emotionally abusive relationship which i got out um and and for really realizing that you know it was not okay to be gaslit it's not okay to be um for somebody to give you emotional bashing it's not okay for somebody to um you know on the on the day of the breakup would i was like it was a lot of emotional bashing to a point where i'm vomiting in the car right and that 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 piece of there is a shame there for me to express it because on my social media I recorded a video like yesterday I recorded it and it was all about what is not okay in an emotional abusive relationship or whatever is not okay. And this, 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 um, and there's, I'm, I'm holding back. I'm holding back in posting it. You know, mm. there's a battle in a battle going on. And often I'm realizing that it's, it's the expression of your opinion in public where I wasn't allowed that when I was younger yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah and this is why I love the work that you do because you're cut through and this is I want to be in that place you know yeah. and I feel like that's a block and I feel like um I want to be in that place where you openly talk about the real stuff cut mm. through direct bang right there you know and getting to that place I guess it's my healing as well getting to that place where I'm openly sharing that content out there as well and that's that's where I kind of just break free yeah, and yeah. I'm sure there's like many people in my scenario 
um what would you just kind of advise what advice would you give people like me or, or listeners well let me say this right um because i think this is really important some of it with me is circumstantial right mm -hmm. i'd love to just be able to go yes because i don't care i'm just doing it right but that's not how abuse works right mm -hmm. like abuse for a start you don't you don't leave abuse mm -hmm. right you escape abuse mm -hmm. and then in most cases in most type of abusive relationships the abuse doesn't stop no even even by the way if the abuser let's hypothetically say passed away right and that's how you got out of the abusive relation the, their abuse their hold over you doesn't stop either yeah mm -hmm. even in that circumstance it doesn't stop right mm -hmm. because because not just because of your own healing work that you that everybody has to try and do because you have no other option but also because of the systems and the structures and the the power things that they put in place mm -hmm. during that abusive relationship are not just about having power over you in that moment they're about gaining power over you throughout your life mm. you know so mm. so like i think it's important to say that because especially when you start getting into the realms of like abusive family members and stuff like that you know oh, yeah. if you start you know then that you can bring shit and then again like we've just talked about you can bring in different cultures and like you might you know in talking about escaping abuse yourself you might actually in a certain culture bring shame on your siblings and your family right so there's all these different things at play and a lot of them have to do with the sort of power structures and everything that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. And we live in a society that still, for some weird reason, doesn't support people that are abused, right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. Like, in fact, they, it, it, in lots of cases, we're set up to support the abuser, right? Yeah. Um, this is the thing, like, um, going back to what you uh, said, because when I was younger about uh, when I was in Pakistan, I was born in Pakistan, so I was, live well, I was there till seven, and there was a teacher in my talks. I always talk about there's a teacher who used to get me. I was about five the memories of like he would get me every day in front of the class and ask me to read something, you know. And if I made a mistake, she would punch me. She would slap me. She would hit me rulers. And I was a five year old, you know, going through it. And it got to a point when I went home and told um, told my, you know, care, care, caregivers like my dad was in the UK, but my mom was there. Um, she was ill herself. She wasn't paying attention to it, but it was like that teacher hit me. And then the they just 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 turn turn that into well, were you naughty? Yeah. Were you naughty? No. Yeah. But then, like, because I wasn't getting that reassurance, or um, they, they weren't giving it much importance. I gave it no importance. I did. I thought, oh, that's that's just okay. That's how it is. And later on in my life, I'm having these memories of this teacher. And yeah. that was the memories that are suppressed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing that, because I think people, I think people struggle to understand what an abuse, a toxic abusive person is. Yeah. Right. So they think, I mean, like people, what people do is they reflect on themselves and they think for me to do that to a child of five years old, they must have done something really, really bad. Yeah. Mm. Because people can't compute that the abusive person doesn't pick on somebody mm. that's bad, mm. right? They pick on, well, they throw the net out really and pick on anyone and then land with the ones that they feel like they can continue to get away with it. Mm. You know? And so that's the hard thing. And, 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 and that's why I think society and systems and structures actually still support abusive people. Mm. Yeah. And a hundred percent, especially in relation, I think the, a lot of people don't realize the, um, we talk about the de the heavier abuse where, you know, there's either like, you know, a physical abuse and sexual abuse. And, you know, with that coming up front, I say, yeah, that's not okay. That's not okay. But nobody talks about emotional abuse, you know, yeah, yeah. and that is a deep cut right there. You know, when I was uh, in this relationship in particular, I didn't realize I was in it. I didn't realize whatsoever because it was just normal to have this person just give you emotional bashing. And then when you go up to this person, say, look, I didn't feel good when, when that happened. And then they end up criticizing you for bringing it up, you know, and then it was just a loop and a cycle and a cycle until um, my friends, I, I told my friends about it and my friends were like, well, you know, that is not right. 
can you not see it? I was like, no, no, it's just me. It's just me because I'm bringing it up too much. Mm. I'm bringing it up too much. But no, it wasn't. Um, And I think it's a blessing. And I think it's really, really needs to, emotional abuse really needs to be talked about in our society more often, whether it's parents, whether it's relationship, friendships, it needs to be talked about um, a lot. And as I guess universe has probably just landed me this situation. It's like, yeah, you're going to be talking about it. Probably just, this person is probably going to be in your book. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, listen, it's, and by the way, you're right. And, and, Emotional abuse runs through all of the abuse anyway. Mm. Mm. You know, like at the heart of physical abuse is emotional control. Mm. And control, so, yeah, like it's all about control. It's all about emotional abuse, manipulation and control and the gaslighting and the breadcrumbing and the oh, like yeah. uh, all of that stuff, you know. Uh, but but if you zoom out a little bit to let's say Western society, let's go in Britain where I live yeah um we live in an abusive system mm. we live in a system where we have people at the top in power that control us yeah mm. take everything that they want serve themselves solely convince us that you know that they're working for us mm. and you know doing what's right for us when they're clearly not mm. and then they make us fight amongst each other yeah right so 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 so, so and then if if anybody shouts not to get too political here, but like we, you know, they have just started to stop protests, right? And they, it's now law that if a protest is too uh, unsettling, mm. right, then it's an illegal protest. So mm. that's gaslighting, mm. right? Because that's people go in, this is not good enough. The arm being treated is not good enough. And then they're going, you know, metaphorically bashing them back down and saying, get back in your box and don't, don't talk yeah. about the abuse. Yeah, so, so it's, 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 it's happening at the top. Yeah, of course it's happening within fi families. You know, yeah. um, that's the system that we live in at the moment. Mm -hmm. How do you think that we can really? Do you feel that we will ever get to a place that we will move past that? Um, I, I mean, I hope so. Mm -hmm. I think it's worse than it's ever been on a on a societal level. Not maybe not ever, but the worst it's been in a long time on a societal mm -hmm. level. Um. But I do think that it has to start with ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to start to work on ourselves and then build community. Mm -hmm. Because for me, you know, even things like Tales to Inspire, which is very like community led, community driven, right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by community, I don't just mean going out and working in the community. I mean, building community, bringing people together, yeah, mm -hmm. to create new community so that we can, we've got a common bond, we've got a common direction. Uh, because one thing that's happened in society over the years is that community has been stripped away. Yeah. 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 Uh, exactly. And 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 dare I say, that's because when people come together, they create power. And yes. that doesn't support power structures at the top, right? No. And like, you know, I know people find this unsettling and unnerving sometimes to talk about or to hear. But mm. but the biggest mistake, I think in Western culture is the way that we individualize people's problems. Mm. If somebody's distressed or struggling or presenting symptoms of somebody who's not in a good place, mm. we don't look at them in the context of their whole experience. Mm. We go, Oh, you've had anxiety a lot, right? Well then you've got an anxiety problem. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Let's look at their life. Yeah. You know, they're struggling to pay the bills. They're on the bread line. Food's going up and up and up. They're in a one person, you know, they're in a, uh, they're a single parent with three kids. One's got, you know, a lot of different complex special needs. Yeah. Mm. Of course you feel anxious all the time. Of course you do when you've mm. got no support whatsoever. Mm. But, but we, Western culture goes, well, if you're feeling anxious all of the time, you shouldn't be, you should be able to deal with that. So if you're not, then there's something yeah. wrong with you. Yeah. And it's bizarre to me. <laughs> And there's, there's a strip away of the support that actually people who will actually give you support as well. So that's the charity work, right? So a lot yeah. of uh, fundings go out the charity work because, oh, we got no funding for it. So you got, you're stuck with anxiety or you, you won't be able to pay your bills. You'll, you'll make yourself ill, 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 Ill. you have no support system around you. Uh, we yeah. are your support system. And if you looked on a family level, right, while we're talking about while we're talking about views, the the the, 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 the people in power are very very rich, yeah, mm. 
Like even our prime minister's wife is a multimillionaire, right? So the people in power are very rich. Hmm. If you looked at a family and you had two very rich parents, hmm. but some of the kids weren't eating properly, hmm. you'd go, this is abusive. Hmm. You've got money and you're not like these kids are, they're not just not eating that much and you're saving all your money. There are literally kids that are having to go to food banks in your family mm. because you're not, they're not getting enough food, right? You would look at the parents, you'd say, this is abusive. Mm. You, you should, you, and we would take them to court and we would make them mm. give their children some money or we would take the children off them. But that's what's happening on a societal level, right? And mm. it's, it's abusive. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. and like it's so clear to me that it's abusive. Yeah. That I, yeah. I, it's mad that people don't see it. It's wild to me. Yeah, it's crazy. So who was our last, I can't even remember, I don't really po follow politics at the moment, but their last Prime Minister who had a uh, disabled son, is it David Cameron or something? Yeah. Yeah, 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 he's now, like, obviously, you have a disabled child and they have all the facilities, but what about the people, like, I care for, I've cared for my mom for 20 years, you know, she's mm. she's been ill since my dad passed away when I was 13, and um, and we've had little to no support well we had support when um you know like when i was younger we had like you know different carers and uh social workers coming in now all of that has been stripped away well you know um so it's like it's like you said like people in uh they have the money and resources they can never be in a position where they have no money and resources and they just getting by you know yeah and yeah yeah is like living if you were in our shoes you will understand the experience exactly. of like oh you only get 50 pound a week mate <laughs> yeah 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 what, and that, that, you in you know in in the fifth richest democracy in the world should charity even exist mm. <laughs> right i mean look at that. i don't think it should not really mm. it's yeah well Right. <laughs> I, I don't know how we got there. Apologize. You I told know, me to go there. You told me to go there. <laughs> it's all good. Always welcome. It's all welcome. Um, so let's get back to um so were you I really wanted to ask you uh, a question about forgiveness. Um were you are you in a place where you're able to forgive your dad um, for what's happened? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do. Um, and I recognize that I'm fortunate that I'm able to. Mm. Uh, I don't forgive. think forgiveness is a must. Mm. I have people in my life that I don't forgive that have mm. done bad things to me. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes forgiveness is, is, is over pushed. That's just what I believe. Yeah. Mm. Like, I think if forgiveness has worked for you, then I think it's great. And I think people should do it. Do, mm. you know, do you and do what works for you. Mm -hmm. But telling everybody else that they should forgive, telling somebody that they should give, forgive somebody who's abused them. Mm. And I know people will say, look, forgiveness is about you. And it's about, it's not about letting them off the hook. It's about letting go of um, the impact they had on you. Mm. And I kind of get that. And I also get that you can move on with your life. And mm. this is how I see things. I'm just a bit more like, you can move on in your life and go, you know what, in this world, for whatever reason and however they come about, horrible people exist. Mm. I've had friendships or any type of relationships with some of them, unfortunately, mm. uh, and it was unfortunate. And they're not in my life now to the best of my ability. And I'm moving on and mm. I don't need to forgive them. Maybe some people say that is forgiveness, but it ain't to me. It's just yeah. leaving them in my past and not letting them have an impact on my life today. That is like, I, that, I guess that's a, that's a forgiveness and healing. Ultimately, I think it's forgiving yourself as well. You know, like I said, we yeah. all riddle with shame and we riddle with this. So it's like forgiving ourselves. Oh, like, oh, I shouldn't have gone in this relationship. I should have done this. I shouldn't have done forgiving yourself. I think that's where the healing is of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, And I think like in our spiritual community, sometimes um, like we talked about abuse. So we, we, we see oh we good see the good love and light in the other person you know the one who's been um whose behavior is not like not good enough you know whose behavior is abusive we end up making excuses 
for them, you know, yeah. rather than saying, actually, that is not okay, mate. Yeah. That's not okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, I, you know, I don't like, I understand the notion of seeing the good in people. And look, I do think there are, there are a lot of hurt people in our world that are good people. A lot mm. of hurt people that do bad things that are good people. Mm. Uh, and as much as we can, we should try and see that, but don't let it cloud seeing the bad as yeah. well. Yeah, you know, the red flags. <laughs> you know, the same yeah, way because I do. think that's what sometimes happens in spiritual communities is that it becomes like this bar where people think that they're the most spiritual because they can forgive and uh, and see the good in even the most horrible people. Mm -hmm. And I think, listen, see the good if you want, but don't you make sure you see the bad. Yeah, so that's what I teach my kids. You know, if if there was a if there was a a, a, a glass of liquid on the side and it was mm -hmm. full of poison. I wouldn't go, yeah, but there is a little bit of water in it. Mm. So you'll mm. be all right drinking it. Mm. Right? I'd go, listen, I don't care if there's a bit of water in there. There's poison in there as well. Leave it alone. Don't yeah. go near it. You yeah. can know that there's water in there, but don't drink the thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I completely agree. I think it's, um, you know, when, I, when you do a lot of uh, healing work, um, since my spiritual awakening, since last part of past seven years, there's been a lot of going into inner family systems and like healing work and a lot of work in deep end work. And what I find is that now I'm <laughs> you get to a place where you see everybody with wounds. <laughs> I was like, oh, great. Like this person might have, you know, this wound. So, so you kind of just leave them to it. But um, also I did find myself in 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 place where. I am making excuses that turns into like, oh, they have trauma, they have fear of rejection, they have this, they have this. Then I'm making excuses for the behavior um, until obviously universe has sent me like, you know, a couple of lessons, like that's not okay. And then it's, it, you can't, you can't uh, marry a potential. You cannot. No, 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 no. no. And, and I hear that stuff all the time with the toxic parent things that I do. You know, I hear people say to me all of the time, you know, you need to understand that some of these parents are like it because of their own trauma. And I'm like, what? Like, mm. OK, yeah. what? So so people should just allow themselves to continue to be abused by someone just because that person was abused mm. before. Mm. Like, nah, understanding mm. that it might help the person that's being abused understand why someone who's supposed to love them abuses them. But it's not a reason to keep them around and let the abuse continue. No, no way is it. No. Nah. So like the hardest decision you make is like really cutting your family members off, you know, um, who aren't, uh, who are abusive. And, and I guess it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it makes me, it just make me feel a bit like, oh, like, you know, there's so many of us deserve so much happiness, but, and what well, we are in this world where we are in this physical reality, where we have to feel this. Uh, stuff sometimes everybody plays a role in your life right yeah yeah um and it's what you do with it it's what you yeah. do with it you know um mm. so um you know we talk about we're talking quite a lot about emotionally abusive parent narcissist parents right so some of our listeners who wouldn't won't yeah if they don't know what a narcissist parents parent is what are the signs Look, I think in one way you have to put, like I would I would just kind of, uh, as a bit of a side note, one of the reasons I use the word toxic instead of narcissistic is because I know that some people will say that narcissistic is more of a medical term, right? So there's something called mm. narcissistic personality disorder. Mm. I would use narcissistic on a personal level, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because I think if you've had one, you, you bloody know you've had one mm. and you don't care about the language that you use because you know what it's like. Mm. Um, but often parents, a lot of the parents that we're talking about, or I'm talking about are like covert narcissist people. Yeah. Mm. These are the people who are like, um, they place themselves at the center of the universe, but they normally do it by making themselves the victim. Mm. Yeah. Now this isn't, uh, me talking about victim mindset, which some people are shamed with when they've been abused. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm. I'm talking about the people that these parents, some of the signs are you see them be absolutely amazing to everybody else all of the time. Mm. And then behind closed doors, when nobody's looking, the way that they show up to you is completely different. They're consistent, consistently horrible to you. 
Um, and if they are ever nice, it's nearly always, not nearly always, it's always because they want something out of you. They are never nice just for being nice sake, right? Nothing they do is out of love. It's all about themselves and how it benefits them, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, they will never, ever self-reflect or look at the part they've played in anything. Mm -hmm. It will always be, that's probably the biggest one, it will always be your fault or somebody else's fault. They will never go, I messed up here and I'm sorry. Mm. Never. And if they do, you'll know that it's fake and it's being done in a way to just regain power. Mm. Mm. So that that is the main signs of it. And there's a lot of gaslighting as well. Is that that's in? Yeah, look, and what they'll do is they'll tell you that you are all of the things that you think they are. That's a classic one. They guess like, they'll yeah. call you narcissistic. They'll call you toxic. They'll yeah. call you two-faced. They'll do all of that, right? And what they're doing is projecting uh, their own shit onto you. That's mm -hmm. Again, that's common. Yeah, and I, get, um, I really wanted to ask you a question about um, people pleasing as well. And do you feel that if you're in an abusive um situation the people please that you um you get a heightened version of people pleasing but definitely because if yeah. you've become a people pleaser in your life right so you abandon yourself and make sure that everybody else is all right all of the time mm. you will try and people please your way out of abuse so oh, you'll be wow. in an abusive relationship yeah and you will try and please them enough so that they don't abuse you which will never work yeah because because abuse doesn't happen because you don't please somebody mm. right um abuse happens because you're uh, with somebody that's abusive right mm, mm, um yeah. but yeah i mean I, I, i've never said it as clearly as that and it's it is that right people yeah. people pleasers will try and people please them work their way out of an abusive relationship and it will never work yeah it, it, it won't it won't because then it's it, it will just keep on repeating the same cycle and you you're the one who gets it <laughs> you exactly. know ultimately Oh uh, yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's amazing. Um, so like going back to, um, victim mentality, you know, when, um, we talk about, um, say for example, being in a abusive relationship or parents, I don't, I haven't personally experienced abusive parents, but like I've experienced like obviously a relationship we're talking about the, the projection is, um, it's so strong, really strong to a point where I am I am going through this in, in my life and I'm going to give you emotional bashing because I'm playing the victim. I've, I'm working, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing all this, I'm doing this, but you're at blame for my uh, downfall. Do you, mm -hmm. do you feel that that is a victim mentality? What, as in from the abuser of what yeah, they're doing? From the abuser, yeah, 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 because they will always it will always be like, you know, even if they, you know, at a real obvious level, people who are physically abusive will physically abuse you and then make you think that the reason that they did it was because of you. It's you. Ah, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I'm a victim here. Like, you know, I grew up in a horrible environment and now you're being horrible to me and I only lashed out because of my own trauma. Yeah. Like, you don't get yeah. to say that, yeah. right? That's yeah. abusive, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, like... And then on the on the micro levels, it is like you say, it's somebody who says, I work really, really hard. I give you everything you want and need. Mm. And this is what you're like when yeah. you're just being yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like. Uh, as somebody who sometimes done things that I wish that I didn't and been not very nice. Right. Mm. The difference here is. And by the way, I've never physically abused somebody, but like I might have said things to people that I wish that I never said. Mm. The difference here is that the next morning or as quickly as I can, I'm like, listen. I'm really sorry that I did this stuff to you. The sorry, like, apologizing I'm sorry, for your action. Yeah. Right. And I, like, I, I hope that you can forgive me. Mm. I wish that I didn't do it. I want to try and work to never do it again. How can I make this up to you? Yeah. How do we change this? Mm. I'm sorry for what I've done to you. I might say I've done, I've done some looking at this and I feel like I'm like that because of this and I'm going to work on that. And that's my responsibility to do that. And I'm going to do that. Yeah. Mm. That's way, way different. Then, yeah. then I called you all of those names last night because yeah. I've got trauma and you triggered me. Yeah, it was you. It's your you. fault for making yeah. me feel like so, this. So, and the solution here, this is an abusive person. The solution here is for you not to trigger me again. Yes, and yeah. not to bring up anything from the past again. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's all about you. This is all your fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very, very different to the responsibility taking, which is what I just talked about. You know? Yeah. Oh, I love this. I love this. I'm a bit conscious of the time because I know uh, Deb said that you 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 need to leave uh, around 11. So uh, I do have rapid fire questions for you. Um, Let's do it. But before then, I really want to ask you, how would you sum up your amazing life so far in three words? In three words? Yes, man. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> Evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, um, tenacity and uh, blessed I feel very blessed oh beautiful love it man right okay let's get into this fire uh, rapid fire questions you ready I'm ready yeah so I'm just <laughs> giving you a quick short answer yeah well you don't have to you can expand on it but if you can stay another like 15 minutes 20 minutes that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> right okay so what is your definition of god universe or life um it's like a power it's a power greater than me mm. whatever controls the things that I don't control. And you know what I tell myself about God? Um, the one thing I know for sure is that I'm not it. Mm. And I spent a lot of my life trying to be, trying to change everything and control everything through, you know, my thoughts and the way that I did things. I realized that I'm not it today. Mm. And I think uh, I'm already elaborating more than I'm supposed to. I? Um, I think sometimes... Uh, uh, we try to put words to it mm. and I've never been able to do it a service mm. of what it is. There's a presence. Mm. There's something, there's something or somewhere that I meet mm. uh, when I find true presence. Mm. Mm. And I think that's probably what it is. Mm. And I think it's a, the art of surrender, isn't it? You yeah. getting it. The just when I get myself surrender. out of the way. Yes. Yeah. Get your ego out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um what do you think happens when you die? My the, <laughs> the honest answer is a boring one because it's I don't know, right? I don't know. Okay. But 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 what I mean by that is that I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um but the way that I live my life and this might not be the most spiritual way but the way that I live my life is that when I'm gone, it's over. And mm. one thing that will happen is that all of the material things that I've gained in my life will leave basically with me. Mm. And all will be all that will really be left is the impact that I had on the people that I care about. Yeah, beautiful. So, so what happens when I'm gone is that my memories will live on in the people that aren't yet gone. And so that gives me control, yeah, because I can keep building them. Oh, beautiful. Today. Love it. Love it. How do you define religion and spirituality? Uh, spirituality is an essence and a feeling. Religion is an attempt to make sense and formalize that. Oh, beautiful. What's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Um, that I will only ever know very little. Mm -hmm. Oh, love that. Do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? Um, sometimes. sometimes. Because sometimes people with horrible beginnings end up creating horrible futures for themselves and everybody around them. Yeah. So it's I, either way. <laughs> yeah. I do think that a lot of people that have difficult beginnings go on to be the strongest that I know. Mm. I, I believe that. Yeah. Mm. I am fully in present moment when? Uh, when I'm with my, when I'm with my children is the best chance of that happening or when I'm on stage speaking. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I love that feeling. You know, that rush of when you're like a powerhouse and energy of people taking in energy of that. Oh, I love it. I love yeah. It. I love that. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, do you believe that there is an end to healing? No. 
No. Carry no. On. But but side point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love your side points. I love it. Um. Uh. <laughs> You have to take your mind away from it sometimes. Otherwise, you'll spend your whole life healing yeah. and you'll miss the present moment. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So, like, yeah. Le le there's always another layer, but make sure that you don't miss the present moment looking for the next layer, you know? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. I love it. Um, The world needs more of what? Breath work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And community, <laughs> and community, yeah. and community. Yeah, okay, and love. Let's throw and love, love into yeah. things. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, if there is someone who's going through that spiritual awakening or dark night of the soul, or going through adversity, and they are struggling in life, what would you say to them? Um, that if you can, if you can step back enough to look at your to you know to have that self-awareness as, as as in separate yourself enough from your being mm. to see your experience in its entirety you'll find that everything that you think and feel makes perfect sense based on the experiences that you've had up until this point wow love it i love it how can people contact you uh go to my website all my links are there probably like Instagram, um, TikTok, but I mean, if you if you want me to definitely, if you want a definite chance of having a response, it's best to email me, which you can do <laughs> through my through my website. <laughs> yeah, I've got no time to respond, but like, uh, Debs will do the way. <laughs> <laughs> my it, my 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 the the inboxes on the other things get a little bit full, and so if I don't yeah. see it, it, sometimes it'll be gone. Oh, amazing. Amazing, man. Oh, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. You know, it's like, um, I'm sure many of our listeners will take away um, a lot of information, actually, in terms of abuse, what's right and what's wrong. Um, mm. And what even if they it might give them insights in their own life, where, whether it's something happened in the past or what's happening now, um, and something that they can look out for in the future. So yeah, thank you, bro, for coming on this podcast. And yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madia Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madia Sosen. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again and I will see you in the next episode.